Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Trees are an important part to any landscape. Today, we're going to talk about how to fertilize them. Also, growing plants under trees or on slopes can be difficult. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Wes Hopper. Mr. Wes is the Natural Resource Manager for the city of Germantown, Tennessee. And Carol Reese will be joining me later. Hi, Wes. Man, we are here with talking about trees a lot, right? Yes. The question we usually get is about fertilizing trees. So what is the best way to fertilize trees? Now, there's a few different ways to fertilize trees. The first, let's start off with the time of year, the pruning. Yes. Okay. Uh, I feel like it's best to fertilize in the, at the beginning of fall okay. and also in the early spring. But let's go back to the late fall. You want to get your pruning out of the way. Go ahead. Okay. If you're going to prune the tree, do your pruning first. Like remove some of this growth that's coming off of it right here if you don't want it. Okay. Kind of thin the tree out just a tad just to get rid of some unnecessary growth or dead branches. And then come in and let's do some fertilizing. Gotcha. Take a look at this root system that we have yeah, here. It's pretty impressive. I mean, we can actually see these roots. Uh, there's a reason for that. Some of these roots are growing in a girdled fashion that might be due to the, the excessive mulch that has been used over the, over the years. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess this tree to be about 10, 12 years old. Roundabout. Okay. This tree needs deep root injection. You could do a granular, just spread it out over the ground. That's not going to go very deep. It's probably going to end up down here for the grass. Yeah. <laughs> you could do a drill hole method where you could take a drill holes in it, just get a, a long auger bit, and you might get caught up in some roots. So that's not necessarily the best way, but it works. Okay. You know, just drill some holes and poison compost towards some good organic material, organic fertilizers down in there. Uh, so we use the organic material though, that's something we rake, you know? You can rake. Over those holes? Uh, yeah, just, so, okay. you can pour okay. it in there, depending on okay. what type of mixture you're, you're gotcha. using. Is it going to be in the powder form? Is it going to be in a liquid form? Or is it going to be like in a, a dirt form? Yeah. Okay. Uh, on large trees, we've done vertical mulching where we've used an actual auger like what you use to put in fence posts. Okay. In vertical mulching, we drill these holes about every three feet apart to, you know, just to create some airspace, and then we backfill with uh, some organic compost. Okay. Or sometimes you can put rocks in there just to create oh, the that. larger airspace. Okay. And the roots are going to move into the that roots, space, right? That's what you want them to right, do. Gotcha. They don't always Makes do sense. that. So, my best practice for deep root fertilizing is to inject the soil with a liquid fertilizer that you inject into the soil at a PSI of about 125 to 150. You can even go up to 200. I know oh, people that, that go up to 200. Okay. So think about this, as you're injecting that nutrient fertilizer, the, bio, the organic fertilizer into the soil, you're gonna to wanna to use a slow release too. I'll explain that in just a minute. Okay, okay. But as you, that PSI, the 150 PSI, goes into the ground and it pushes that soil out. It creates an air, water, nutrient space. Wow. So it creates space in there. So like with this soil right here, take a look at these roots. They're growing right on top of the yes, ground. They are. Yes, they are. You're not gonna find very many of these roots down low. I promise you, this, this soil is not, it's good for willow trees and stuff that we have growing around us. Those are wet bottomland type trees. This is a maple. It's a bottomland tree too, but it's planted in a, a manicured landscape. Right. So. With that injection, you're going down eight to ten, six to ten inches down, and you're injecting fertilizer, airspace. You're going to start promoting this tree to go to where that water and nutrient space is. Gotcha. So the roots are lazy. In this case, they're staying <laughs> on top of the ground. Yeah. You, they're growing down the hill. They're getting mowed over. Yes. So now we're going to, as this tree grows, you're creating that space, and it may take several years for this to happen, but you're going to get a root system that's going to be down, and you're going to mitigate the soil with your organic fertilizer mm. and other products that you can inject in here. Let's say, for example, you put the fertilizer in the soil, and your pH is off. 
So that creates that buffering capacity to where even with the nutrients in the ground, the water's in the ground, that buffering capacity prevents that tree from being able to absorb it through its small feeder roots. Okay. The feeder roots are like hair roots. They're real yeah. small like our hair. So you want to add something to the soil that's going to change that pH. Uh, usually it's going to be lime that you want to add to it. Okay, that takes a little bit of time for, yeah. for a tree to change that pH, but you just have to do it. Something else to add to your mixture of fertilizer is mycorrhiza, mm -hmm. a mycorrhiza inoculant. And you can get it in either an ecto or XO uh, type mycorrhiza formula. In this area, we're gonna have um, Amanita, Rosapogon, uh, different ones like that. There's different, different uh, species of those uh, two right there. Okay, okay. Uh, but what that mycorrhiza does when you inoculate your soil with it, it actually works symbiotically with the feeder roots. It grows and its mycelium grows and it attaches itself to the, to the feeder roots of the tree. And now it's feeding off the protein of the roots when it sheds its, basically its scale or its bark off, it feeds on the proteins produced by those roots. And in turn, it works as a sponge and it so pulls the water, yeah. the nutrients into that? the tree where cool. typically it, before the mycorrhiza was there, it wasn't available to it. Okay. So they kind of work together. Right. And research shows that trees that have been inoculated with that mycorrhiza are much health healthier than a tree that hasn't been inoculated with it. So it's very beneficial. Oh, that's good. Yeah, mycorrhiza. That's good. That's uh, good. That's Let me ask you about this again, because you mentioned it. So one more time, I usually get a lot of questions about, so I have my roots above the ground. Mm -hmm. How can I encourage those roots to get back down into the ground? Will they go back down into the ground? Not the typically. That's a very I mean, good question. Like this, so yeah. what we want to do with that point, since you've mentioned that, that's a very, very good, okay. good subject right there. Uh, you want to get down, get down and close with the tree and pull this back. This is going to require a tool. Yeah. And these roots that you see right here, okay. f follow it back to where it originated. So that root might have come from this side of the tree. Yeah, it looks like so it eventually, as this tree is growing, yeah. It's not growing vertically with the tree like those. It's growing across the tree. So over time, as this girth grows here, it's going to attach to here because this root's going to grow too. Gotcha. And it's going to end up girdling this side of the tree. Mm. It may graft into it being a maple tree, or it, it may not. It may just cut the circulation off right here. So after you trace that root back, wait until the winter time when the, all the leaves are falling, all the nutrients are dropped back down into the, the root system for storage, you might want to cut that root off. Wow, okay. And don't use an ax, don't use a chainsaw. <laughs> Find out where it's at and yeah. try to use some hand tools so you don't cause damage to other parts. Okay, gotcha. And then you come back over here to this other side and work on these roots that are closer to the trunk on this side. Because you see now, we've got two sides of the tree wow. that are potentially going to be girdled. Cut these off over here and you don't want to go crazy just cutting all the roots <laughs> off, but you're going to have to at some point right. for the tree's health. Right. I so would the say but the tree will still be okay, because I'm, I'm sure be. people are listening to mm -hmm. you like, okay, you're going to cut, cut that the roots. Root. You just cut roots. Well, you can cut the branches out of the tree. Why can't you cut a few roots? All right, there you go. There you go. Okay. You know, I mean, the roots are, serve a distinct purpose, you know, conduction, storage, anchorage. So you want to be cautious on which ones you cut off. Okay. It's best to ask a certified arborist, sure. somebody that knows and that's <laughs> sure. familiar. Not every certified arborist is familiar with root pruning, but most of them are. Right. And uh, well, that's why we ask you, Wes. Yeah, that's why we ask, ask you. me. That's Just sure. call me. I, I love the questions. And I, I love the to share my information. Oh, we know. We appreciate that. Uh, for I sure. do. But get, once you get where you feel like you're comfortable, you're not taking off too much. Uh, it'd be like me going to the, getting a haircut <laughs> yeah. and they cut off too much. I'm not going to like it. Yeah. The tree will tell you it won't like it either. Right. But. You get out here and you see these growing on top of the ground. Yeah. Let's say, let's use another example. Imagine this is at your grandmother's house and your grandmother walks on a cane or a walker mm -hmm. and she can't go out into the yard because yeah. you got all these roots. Mm -hmm. So just after you start promoting the root growth down low, think about either adding just a small layer of, of sod or some topsoil and maybe some sod on top of it. That way you're hiding the roots. Now I've done this before with a maple tree. This maple tree had literally taken over the front yard. So we can do some root pruning on it. And, and I was in discussion with the landscaper on this. And while we're looking, 
at the, all these roots on top of the ground, and I look at the neighbor's yard next door, and I said, got an idea, guys. <laughs> We're going to not worry about cutting all these roots. We're going to add and smooth this out with a little topsoil or, or organic good soil, and then we're going to put sod on top of it, and then we're going to be done with it. Wow! So that was the easiest solution. So that doesn't smother the roots. Putting if the you put on top too of it? much of dirt on top of it, you're going to change your water flow and everything else. So yeah. be cautious. Once you get over, let's say four inches of, of fill, you're going to start cutting off the some of the air flow or the oxygen supply that right. gets down deep. But that's where that deep root injection comes from gotcha. because you're creating new space down there for your air water nutrient. Wow. And do that as on an annual basis. Just include that in on your tree budget. Okay. Put yeah. it in on your budget. Yeah. And one more time before we have to leave. So the best time to fertilize is? Late fall or early spring. Late fall, early spring. Thank you, Wes. Appreciate okay. the knowledge as always. Thank you. What we have here is poison ivy. Leaves of three, let it be. Healthy poison ivy this is. Um, all plant parts actually are poisonous. Uh, it contains the oil urugiol. And if you come in contact with this plant, you will definitely have a rash. So you want to be careful. Uh, a good way to control it is if you would cut it down uh, about an inch, leave about an inch of it up, the stem that is, and paint it with some glyphosate, uh, some Roundup, and that will help to knock out this vine. Because uh, otherwise, you have to get in here with long sleeve shirts, long, uh, long pants, and come out here and pull it out. But I would advise, if you can, again, cut it, leave it about an inch up the stem, paint it with some Roundup. That way, you can get rid of it. Hi, right, Ms. Carroll. Let's talk about growing under trees. How difficult is that? Well, it can be very difficult. Um, there's a lot of challenges to growing under trees, shade, First and mm -hmm. foremost, because plants we know need sunlight. But to me, one of the great challenges is the competition from the tree roots. Right. So people, you know, they want to come in and bring a load of topsoil. <laughs> they sure do. <laughs> and that's not good for trees. Right. Uh, tree roots do need oxygen. So you need to be thinking about, yes, I do agree we need some sort of substrate there for those plants to get purchase. But I bring in something very light and fluffy. Okay. In this area, it might be gin trash. You might find some composted mm -hmm. sawdust mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. have uh, mills near you. Uh, any kind of light, fluffy, composted type soil is great to bring in and help get those plants established. And I'll just mound it up a bit okay. and put the plants in there. And then remember, they're going to have to have lots of water because that light, fluffy soil is going to dry out quickly. Plus, mm -hmm. the tree roots are sucking the moisture. Trees, you That's know, right. steal all that water and moisture. Um, it's really important to, if you do want to till some, and I try, I really don't. I don't recommend that you go in there and till up those tree roots. Uh, though some people will to kind of put it in their little pocket, and they can, they can handle that. It can manage that. But how much disturbance can a tree handle? In a, to me, a general rule of thumb or even if I'm going to cover up tree roots for some reason, okay. is if I can keep it less than 30% okay. of that tree root area, then that tree's going to be able to handle it. Okay, less than 30 Okay. 30%, somewhere right in there. Once we start getting up to half, we're really challenging that tree because people forget about that. Trees have to have that air exchange. Right. And you're exactly right about that. I try to mention that to folks all the time. And here's something else I see around town as well. They use the heavy mulches. And they want to plant their annuals, you know, right in that mulch. Yes. And then they water it to death. Yes. And usually what happens is that mulch is up against the trunk of the tree. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you're doing all that watering. It right. starts, you know, that it starts to decay, of course. Yes. You know, around that tree. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you there need you a balance it. between moisture retention and good drainage and right. air exchange. So finding that right material is crucial. And then, of course, picking the right plants. Mm. Um, some people want to put a vigorous ground cover under trees, and I say, no, you don't. A vigorous ground cover is going to take over the world, and there's going to, unless you just never want to garden there again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, because they're going to, they don't know when to stop. Sure. Uh, a vigorous sure. ground cover is not going to stop right at the edge of the tree and go, okay, I've done my work here. Right. It's going to either, some things will climb the tree like English ivy, mm -hmm. and some things will continue out into your turf areas, or swamp any of your ferns, hostas, or hydrangeas. But yeah, I always wonder what, you know, the big fascination of growing things under trees like that, though, especially when you have these big oak trees that we have here in Shelby County. Well, because it's a beautiful place to garden. Yeah. I love to quote, a lot of people remember okay. probably Plato Tuliatis. 
that the lowest maintenance garden in the South is a woodland garden. Because mm -hmm. he said, because the South wants to be woods. Wood. Right. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't challenges. Certainly there will be some weed control and that kind of thing. But it's certainly easier to edit that garden in the shade than it would be out in the hot sun. And you're going to have sure. less disease pressure. And you're going to enjoy your garden more. If you have a shade garden, let's face it, who wants to go out in their garden in July? And, <laughs> exactly right. You know, I, I'm not going to be out there nearly as much. I love shade. I grew up with shade, and I think a house should have shade. <clears throat> for some, um, for sometimes it's very important to think about actually for conservation purposes because we're minimizing the uh, best way that you can lower your electric bills is to get shade on the house. That's the number one way. Wow. So I know here in Memphis we're nervous about yeah. trees over the house because we've had what yeah, was the, the most recent storm, storm right. and then Hurricane Elvis a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But there are certainly things that you can do. Uh, the types of trees that you choose uh, can also be safer, but there are certainly gardening under trees is a great way to go. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, Ms. Carroll, let's talk about this. How about growing on slopes? What do you think about that? Well, slopes are a, a lot of times a real issue with homeowners we will see that they had to do maybe some severe grading to get that house mm. or that subdivision into that property and then you have to deal with the steep slope. Uh, we really don't like to mow slopes. It can be dangerous. Uh, it can yes. be hard to even grow grass on them if there's a lot of erosion. So what we try to do is think about different ways to deal with it. Number one, and this sounds apparent, it's not always true, is water runs downhill. <laughs> right. I see a lot of people say, I kind of forget about that. So if water's running down the slope and eroding your soil, number one thing you might think about is how do I divert that water? Okay. It might take a berm across the top of that slope to divert it down to safer areas so that you can start to get something established on that slope. And if that's not possible, there is, you're going to have to do something to stop the water running down that slope in order for those plants to take purchase. Mm -hmm. So you could do terracing, which could be a more right. formal kind of thing with landscape timbers or right. stone or pavers. Or you could actually do kind of temporary things until the plant takes purchase. And I will take common sticks that I've picked up in the woods <laughs> um, using something like straw or pine straw. And I'm making little temporary fences. Ah. Just letting that straw or that pine straw is going to catch and stop that erosion okay. while my plants take purchase. And then once the plants have grown over all that and take, had a chance to get their roots established, then that's going to mm. rot, disappear, and improve the soil anyway. But you can't just plant things on there. And I, of course, have some favorite plants that can cover slopes quite well. Winter jasmine is one of my okay. favorites. It's okay. a beautiful weeping shrub that will anchor wherever it touches the ground. Okay. Appears to be evergreen, although it's not, but because it's such a dense um, green stem, a lot, a lot of stems coming out of that one base. It blooms in winter, January jasmine or winter jasmine, uh, but we have to get those things established. So stop that water flow. And again, uh, I can address this in more detail. Wow, that's some so, good stuff. Yeah. Now for your winter jasmine, Conditions, sun, shade? Winter jasmine will take either sun or shade okay. as long as it's got good drainage. It will not tolerate a wet site. It's a really nice plant, one of my favorite plants to use. Um, I love it when I need to hide ugly <laughs> walls. or It actually, if you plant it at top of a tall wall, it'll cascade and almost act like a vine. And of course, I appreciate anything that blooms in the winter. Now, people may confuse it with Florida jasmine, which is not quite as okay. hardy. Winter jasmine is a different plant. <clears throat> One of the scientific names that I really like, Jasminum nudiflorum, because oh. <laughs> it flowers on the nude wood, on okay. the bare nude wood. Okay, nudiflorum. Okay. Yes. But uh, mm -hmm. slopes, uh, to me, is one of the ways that we lose a lot of soil. We need to think about how we can anchor them. Ground covers, again, are an option, but I like to see sweeps of different plant materials, and I actually prefer shrubbery over ground covers a lot of times when we have a big area. Shrubbery over the ground cover. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about grasses? Grasses are a possibility, okay. certainly, um, and grasses have good deep roots that could anchor. Right. The thing I love about a shrub is you start computing how many ground covers you need per square foot, it turns into a lot of money very quickly, right. whereas the right type of shrub, a shrub selection, could cover six to eight to ten feet. You know, so you're looking at a lot okay. fewer plants overall and having to water that many right. fewer plants and take care of their anchored needs uh, until they get established. Um, mulch is probably not going to stick. Yeah. <laughs> Forget pine nuggets, right, red yeah. bark. Those pine are needles float. or straw would work, you know, because okay. we talk about it, as long as we use some sticks to anchor it. Um, and some people can actually stick cuttings of plants that root easily right into that ground. Hmm. Um, uh, 
Eliagnus of mm. NGI would probably do that if it's stuck at the right time. For Scythia, it would be great. Okay. For Scythia, roots easily. Okay. You can stick those cuttings in the ground during cool, moist times of the year. That's going to form a massive weeping shrub that's going to help stop that erosion. Okay. So um, that could be part of your sticks is that right. these are actually plants that are going to take root and help anchor that slope. Okay. How about planting trees, though, on slopes? Is well, that trees, a good idea or <clears throat> not? Or? Certainly, I think it can be. Uh, and it's, a lot of times there may be a place that you absolutely want a tree. Again, you're probably going to have to build some kind of containment system okay. to give it support sure. while it gets established. Uh, perhaps a little mini wall. Think about how the water has to be around. But the thing about water runs downhill is yeah. remember that and take care of that. Stop and slow that, that movement of soil while they get established. Water flows downhill, folks. Yes. <laughs> you think people would know that, but it's surprising. I'll go, where, where was the water going to go? And people didn't think of it. And sometimes these are actually landscapers I've seen. You know, you didn't uh -oh. leave a place for the water to go. Right. So. How about that? Thank you again for that wonderful information, Ms. Carey. We always appreciate that. Glad to do it. All right. So we are in the garden. We're looking at this tomato plant. I think we may have possible tomato hornworm damage. As you can see here, the leaves have been eaten off. And something else you can do, you can actually look for the fecal material. And guess what? There's some right there that lets me know a tomato hornworm is near. And there it is, the tomato hornworm. As you can see, the horn, hence the name tomato hornworm. I've been doing a lot of damage here. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to get out the sprayer. Uh, it has BT product in it. Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, make sure that you spray your tomato plant, get good coverage. And what happens is the tomato hornworm is going to eat the foliage. Once he eats the foliage, it's going to give him a stomach ache and he's going to die. All right, here's our QA segment. We're actually ready. We have some great questions here. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, here's our first viewer email. I rescued a crepe myrtle and transplanted it to my yard. It had been previously cut on. Now that it has been established, how do I keep the shoots from emerging from the previous cuts? And this is done from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Good All question. Right. Good question. And we get that question a lot about the shoots from the crepe myrtles. Almost every day. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like anyway. Uh, there's two ways that you could go. You could go with a chemical control. You could okay. use something like they call sucker stopper. Uh, I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. And you could use bonide. It's another what they call sucker punch. Okay. And both of them are a little expensive, but they, they do work. Okay. You have to continue to do it. I mean, you reach down below the mulch. If you've got mulch, and clip it off and then spray the, the uh, stob that you've cut with the uh, sucker stopper. Yeah. Or you can do like I do with my crepe myrtle is I just break them off. I don't That's cut them do. off. I just break yeah. them off. Yeah. If you can't break them, then just get a good clean cut. But I prefer to break them off at the ground. Right. Same thing I do. I break them off at the ground if I can, or I just get the pruners out and I prune, prune it back, you know, as far down as I possibly can. Yes. Yeah. Because the thing about the sucker stopper, of course, it's a plant growth regulator. It is. Right. And it is expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, I've used it before in the past, but yeah, I just prefer just to get the pruners out. and. It's much easier. It's much easier. And plus, if you enjoy working in the yard, then it makes it simple. Yeah, it makes it simple. Yeah. yeah. So do that early and often, though. Yeah, I usually do it early and often, you know, some yeah. of my crepe myrtles because they're still young. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, a master gardener told me once, just take your pruners with you when you go out into your yard, and if you see something that needs doing, just clip it, and that way you're not spending your entire Saturday working on your entire yard. Yeah, it just, makes sense to me. Yeah. Huh? Like those master gardeners, right? I do. That makes sense. All right, we're done. I hope that answers your question. All right, here's our next viewer email. How should I prune my Japanese maple? It was damaged by the late frost. And this is Sally from Sevierville, Tennessee. So how about that? So yeah, she knows it was the late frost. Yeah. So how do you recommend pruning that? Uh, looking at the picture, it looks like a lace leaf Japanese maple. Uh, I thought it was. I, <laughs> I have one I just did. like that. I have one as well. I should yeah, do. I keep mine in a pot so I can move it around. OK. And well, I, you smart. I, mine is in the ground. But yeah. That's I got it away from the sun is. and away from the winds for the winter time because I know how delicate those yes. trees are. Very, very delicate. So what I would recommend to this tree is Give it a light fertilizer, okay. not too much, but enough to promote some new leaf growth, <clears throat> and only prune off what's dead. I want you anything that's dead, dying, or diseased yeah. is what I, you know, usually tell folks. Yeah, to do. just only prune out what's what's died back, mm -hmm. and you want that tree to be able to sustain itself in the future. So leave as much green on it as you can until it gets better, and then from that point on, being a lace leaf, prune it to shape, and prune it usually in the early spring. Yep. That's when I do mine. That's when I do mine. All right. So there you have it, Miss Sally. Thank you for the question. 
Here's our next severe email. Help! This dogwood tree is my next door neighbor's. Looks like some kind of boring beetle is killing this awesome tree. Yeah. There are wood shavings at the base of the tree. Is there a way to save the tree? And this is Sammy from Divesburg, Tennessee. So, boring beetles, is there a way to save the tree? And as you can see there, that, that looks pretty tough to me. This but looks pretty that, tough. That, that looks this, pretty bad. This looks pretty far gone. Yeah, that looks, yeah. This tough. looks like this flowering dogwood was attacked by dogwood borers. Uh-huh. Yeah. And when the boring, again, when the boring insects attack a tree, it's already in a weakened state right, already. already so they may not be getting enough water on this tree. I don't, I don't know the yard. They could right. have irrigation or maybe not. I don't, I'm not sure about that. But once they get attacked by the dogwood borers, it does send them into a decline. Mm -hmm. I don't think using imidacloropid, the soil drench on the dogwood borers at this point are going to help. I don't think so either. You could try, but I would use something more in line with a spray something that has permethrin in it, mm -hmm. or it's one of those ethrins, mm -hmm. and uh, mix it with a spreader sticker, which is a, more like a, an oil type um, product, and it helps that permethrin or the borer treatment chemical stick to the wood of the tree and stops those borers. Right. But you gotta be quick. Yeah, you gotta be quick. And again, there's that window. You know, we're talking April, you know, yes. I used to tell folks mid-April. Yeah. You know, just about June for the most part. Yeah, but don't give up. Give it a shot. Yeah. Don't give up. I've never Sammy. met a tree that wanted to die. <laughs> there you go, Sammy. Don't give up on it. But yeah, that looks pretty bad, but don't give up, yeah. all right? Wes, it's been fun, man. Been a, been a blast. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want more information on trees or growing in shade, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.